I'm I'm Hamish Kreber. I'm a final year PhD student at Edinburgh, um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is really an overview of what I've been doing as part of my PhD project, but really focusing on um, the the potential for biochar in improving growth in in seedlings and productive forestry. Um, so just to start i really um had four big questions when i started my um project to look at one is what are the most suitable systems for biochar used in forest establishment it's quite particular um forestry in that agricultural applications of biochar or agricultural systems don't really fit and um, particularly in the application phase so what we really started on is looking at how can biochar be best used in forestry, but also is that going to be practical? We didn't want to really be um, studying a system which isn't actually implementable in, in forest management. The next thing that we wanted to, to obviously test is, can biochar be used to improve seedling growth? And to do that, what we really wanted to do is focus on nutrient limited soils. So most of or much of productive forestry, particularly in the UK, is on very poor, low yield soils, which are actually often nutrient deficient. So that is what is limiting the growth of the trees. Um, next, we wanted to look at the mechanisms behind that. And then lastly, what are the implications of, of, of what we found on the carbon accumulation and the carbon balance of woodland creation? Now, this is just going to give you a really quick overview of productive forestry systems in the UK are the main one anyway, which is clear fell forestry. So following woodland creation, trees take a little bit of time to get established up to canopy closure. And that's typically anywhere between 10 to 20 years really for, for productive species. And it's in that initial phase where the timed canopy closure can be very, very much um, altered depending on management practices. So trees which, which aren't established effectively can take a very long time to actually get to that canopy closure. And once canopy closure occurs, there's much less competition with um, other plants and actually the system is essentially closed, particularly in terms of phosphorus cycling. So actually growth, growth increases very rapidly. In Britain, it's normally clear fell forestry. So the whole crop is harvested and then restocked. And this creates quite a a pertinent issue for um, phosphorus availability because forests typically have a very close phosphorus cycle but when we actually go and remove timber from a from a from a woodland and harvesting and also the lateral transport associated with um, phosphorus loss from from particularly needles what we actually see is a very rapid um, decrease in the, in the soil phosphorus pool and actually because most well much of um upland forestry is already phosphorus limited on phosphorus poor soils the issue with with soil available phosphorus is is exacerbated due to management um, so if we can improve tree growth with biochar then actually um, we can potentially mitigate some of these phosphorus um, loss issues now this is um, a photo of the field site where we did lots of experimental work and I just wanted to very briefly discuss the the actual difficulty of using biochar in forestry in, in, in or forest systems. One is, um, if this works, one is that it's very rough. So actually, applying biochar to forest forestry is very very difficult, and we can't really do large scale blanket dosages. So what we were looking at is actually trying to do low dose targeted applications where biochar can go directly to the trees. So in this picture, you can see um, some planting mounds and we were looking at actually, can we apply biochar directly to those and going into the roots of the trees? The other one is application frequency. Unlike agriculture, which can have biochar applications annually or biannually or, or fairly frequently, once a crop is established, it's very difficult to actually get back into it and do any further um, application um, application practices. So a mature crop 
there's very little once once a crop's established in, in terms of fertilization that can be done. The next one is environmental sensitivity. So lots of forests are, are, are on fairly sensitive catchments um, and actually adding nutrients to a nutrient limited ecosystem has its risks. So what we wanted to do is mitigate that. And that's partly why we were looking at targeted application. And then the, the, the next one's biochar performance. We wanted to specify a biochar which which had properties which which target the um, the soil properties which are limiting growth, and in in the case of our study, it was particularly um, phosphorus availability. And then the next one is circularity. We wanted to create a system which um, which was which was using um, forest derived um, feedstocks, which could then filter back into into the forest. So the system that we tested, we, we looked at three biochar types and I just quickly run through them because I use the same um, acronyms throughout. So softwood pellet derived biochar was a control biochar. It's fairly high density and um, it has low nutrient um, content. Sorry about that. Um, the next one was VCZ biochar, which was our specified biochar. It's fairly high in, in available phosphorus, particularly compared to softwood um, pellet drive biochar and it's made from the vascular cambial zone of wood and actually that's where the majority of, of nutrients are held and it's actually a fairly common sawmill residue so the the, the biochar was derived from the the, the outer kind of centimeter of of timber um, and I'll, I'll go through the the properties of that briefly shortly and then we compared that against a phosphorus infused biochar, which is SWP plus P rock phosphate application, which is the typical, um, the typical forest fertilization regime and also triple superphosphate targeted application um, and no application. We tested it against three different species. So the three most commonly planted um, conifer species in the UK, Sitka spruce, Douglas fir and Scots pine. And then we looked at three different dosages. And because we were doing targeted dosages, these actually equate to um, per hectare rates of 40 grams per tree equates to about 17 tonnes per hectare. When we look at the, the ratio between biochar and soil, where we're trying to have an influence on. Um, what we did was we tested growth of targeted application of these biochars, both in a field experiment and a controlled polytunnel experiment. But we also looked, um, we also conducted rhizobox experiments as well to look at um, root foraging for nutrients in biochar. I'm gonna um, briefly go through those results shortly. So this is just softwood pellet biochar, um, VCZ biochar, and then the, the softwood pellet infused with phosphorus biochar. Now what we found in the polytunnel experiment was biochar, particularly the, the higher dosages of VCZ biochar and infused phosphorus biochar significantly improved above ground biomass accumulation. And this was after two years. So in, in the first year of growth, we don't really see very much um, difference. And that's because um, trees don't typically grow very much in the first year after being planted. But on the left hand side, we can see the control treatment. So we saw significant improvement in Sitka spruce, Douglas fir, um, and Scots pine. So we clearly could see that seedling um, above ground biomass was improved with biochar application. We, we also tested chlorophyll fluorescence, um, and which, is a, which can be used as a proxy for, for tree health. And that also showed that biochar improved, improved tree health. So this is just a quick, um, a quick overview of, of what the trees looked like after a year. So we can see that with certain biochar dosages, uh, we, we, we got much stronger growth. Um, in, in the controlled environment experiment. So the key findings were that the, the optimum dosages for biochar is, is, very, is very different for different biochar types and species, um, but that the, the specified biochar, which is the VCZ biochar, 
showed con consistent growth for, for all um, improvements for all, all treatments. One of the key things that we also found was that there's clear root death in high phosphorus, so, so um, targeted application of cells that are infused phosphorus biochar, but also targeted um, phosphorus application and also increased mortality in those. The needle and the woody biomass of above ground biomass showed the same result, and that was also that um, there was improved improved growth. So both the needle component and the, the woody component was improved with biochar. What we also saw though was that there was no, no difference in the below ground biomass um, between the control, which was no application, and biochar treatments, which isn't particularly what we expected. Um, but what we did see was that the softwood um, pellet infused biochar and triple superphosphate applications did limit um, did limit root growth. So when we go into what the actual properties were of the growing media in the treatment areas, what we saw was clear liming by the VCZN softwood pellet biochar. So they increased the pH, whereas the softwood pellet infused with phosphorus and the high phosphorus, um, so the TSP, we saw a very clear drop in in the pH of the growing media, and this was this was at planting. Um, the the growing media that we used for control had very low available phosphorus. The SWP biochar still had low phosphorus. The VCZ had fairly high phosphorus, but the conventional fertilizer and infused softwood pellet biochar had very high phosphorus. But we didn't see the improvement in growth in these treatments as we would expect. So obviously that creates a bit of a question of, of why is the tree not being able to exploit the phosphorus that's within the treatment? Um, the other thing that just to quickly consider as well is the, the difference in, in metals and, and calcium as well, and cadmium, which was one of the things that we looked at for the, the reduction in growth in the, the infused and the applied um, phosphorus fertilizer was, was it cadmium toxicity, but the threshold levels that we had in our treatments, so seven, um, milligrams per kilogram is actually well below the the threshold for, for cadmium toxicity. So that wasn't actually too much of an issue. So the next experiment that we did was to look at actually, are the trees exploiting the phosphorus that is delivered via biochar? So what we have here is just an overview. So we had these Rhizobox experiments, which we ran for 12 weeks and we, we mapped out the new root, root growth each week so that we could actually see where the roots were growing and whether there was any preferential movement towards nutrient sources. So in the control, which is on the left, we saw no clear difference in root density in the riser box. So we've got the treatment area on the left here. In the TSP, so the triple superphosphate, we saw clear root avoidance um, from the treatment areas. And for the VCZ, we saw clear um, root preferential growth into, um, into biochar areas. Um, so there was clear exploitation of the nutrients there. Now, what we wanted to actually see was how, were, how was the biochar that was coming into contact with the, sorry, how were the, root, the trees or seedlings coming into contact with the biochar getting the nutrients out of the biochar? So what we can see here is a VCZ biochar particle, um, a root here, which actually doesn't penetrate the biochar. And we can see the, the mycorrhizae hyphae throughout the, the biochar particle. Um, for all of our treat, biochar treatments, there was very little root penetration of, of biochar, but actually when we look inside the biochar particles, so we've got a vessel here, and we can see the clear hyphae going throughout the biochar particle. Mm -hmm. So we can see clear exploitation of, of the biochar by the, by the hyphae. Um, so if the, if the roots are getting, well, if the trees are getting um, phosphorus out of the biochar, then 
the the ECM, well, the the mycorrhizae associations are, are clearly very important um, in the nutrient transfer. And actually, this is a this is a um, a section of biochar that's been cut. So this is the internal spaces, and what we can see here is a vessel, the tracheids, and then we can really clearly see the hyphae, which is going through the vessels, and then it's being able to move through the structure of the biochar through the pits in the original wood structure um, so we can really clearly see and th this was throughout the um the vcz biochar that we could see this but in softwood pellet biochar which is obviously a very it's a very dense um it's very dense and the cellular structure of the wood is lost during the feedstock preparation so what we saw, saw here is actually although there was hyphae present it wasn't getting into the internal spaces of the biochar and it was really having to move through the th move through biochar particles through the through the spaces between pellet aggregates so although there is nutrients held within the pellet aggregate it's very hard for actually the the fungi touch to to access that what we also did was fluorescence microscopy to actually in the in the soil rather than actually the biochar of the roots to see whether there was any difference in fungi abundance um, within within different treatments and actually what we found here so this is the what it was the mean distribution for the fluorescence intensity of different um, of the different treatments and what we found was that in TSP so triple superphosphate applied biochar, the fluorescence intensity was very low and that showed that there was very little, um, there was very little fungi present within, within those samples. We sieved out any plant matter so that we were confident that whatever we were seeing was, um, was the fungi, but within the control in the VCZ, we saw that there was clear, um, there, there was, fairly abundant um, fungi present within within the samples. And that's kind of to be expected that that the um, that a very, very high phosphorus fertilizer reduces um, mycorrhizae um, and is actually it, it limits growth of that. And one of the reasons for that is 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 the big is is the pH drop um from the high phosphorus dosages so what we can see here is at, at planting and at year two the ph of the different treatments and the thing to notice here is really that in the swp plus p and the tsp we see very low ph around three and three and a half um which is enough to actually cause root mortality at planting and although that we see that the um the pH does recover with time in these treatments. The root development doesn't, and at year two, the root mass of of these of seedlings growing in in very high phosphorus dosages is very small. Another reason for that is also because they're within very high phosphorus. There's no reason for the roots to develop out with um, those areas. And actually, once the available phosphorus has dropped from the very fast release, um, for very fast release TSP, actually what we see is, is limited growth. Um, and that really helps to, to, to show the benefit of slow release biochar as a fertilizer over conventional fertilization methods, particularly in forestry, where we are looking for, for growth improvements over multiple growing seasons rather than single applications. Um, so the seedlings can't exploit the phosphorus source in, in high phosphorus treatments because of one, no, no mycorrhizae fungi present, but also low root, low root area. So this is just giving a brief overview of the, of the soil seedling interaction that we mapped out between ECM fungi biochar soil and the root system. And actually it's a very complicated system that we need to consider. And the role of, the role of um, ectomycorrhizal fungi within, within the system is, is vital to actually seedlings being able to exploit biochar.
Another thing that we've also, um, another aspect that we've not looked into in great detail is the um, potential for biochar as, as a refuge for soil mesofauna and microfauna. So within the samples that we we saw, particularly with the, the high, high porosity in um, internal spaces of VCZ, so vascular cambial zone derived biochar, we saw very significant communities of um, of mites, nematode worms um, as well. And actually the role of those within nutrient cycling is likely very important, but we, we didn't unfortunately study that, but that could be quite an exciting um, area to look into. And here we can see just to, to kind of emphasize the importance of, of fauna within nutrient cycling is this one of a, this is a, a mite in our sample and we can clearly see um, fungal hyphae going into the, the pore of the, of the mite to actually get the nutrients out of it. So what I'm giving you is a really brief overview of the results from our growth trials and our um, nutrient cycling um, work. What I've also did was looked at those growth improvements of biochar amendment in the context of woodland establishment carbon balance. So the gains that we, we saw from the seedlings experiment, what I did was in conjunction with other life, um, LCA work that I did on woodland creation carbon balance, we use those gains to actually see how the early growth improvements of trees with biochar actually impacts soil carbon, um, or sorry, carbon balance of woodland creation. And what we're really looking at is, does the time of woodland creation to net carbon positive, so when actually the, it starts to act as a net greenhouse gas removal technology, so it starts to, to store carbon, can that be short? in low yield woodlands with biochar application and what we did was we looked at the impact of growth improvement on the carbon balance. So the big question here was does biochar and poor soil nutrient regime and low disturbance cultivation equal quicker year of net zero? And this is I'm just going to do a very quick um, overview of the results. So what we see is the solid line is without biochar and the, the dashed line is with biochar. And this is in low disturbance so what we see is without biochar, it takes about 15 years for yield class 10 Scots pine to become, to start actually increasing the, the carbon stock of that land. But depending on the type of biochar and the dose, we can change that to between eight and 13 years with biochar application, which is a very big difference. What we do see though, is actually in mature, in mature end of rotation woodlands, biochar at the dosages that we've looked at doesn't really change um, the end of rotation biomass. In high disturbance forestry where soil carbon loss is much greater, there's much less potential for biochar because the growth improvements are, are the proportion of growth improvements is, is outweighed by the soil carbon release. We see that actually there's very little change in um, the year of net zero with biochar amendment. So biochar is less less impact on year of net zero in in high disturbance scenarios so just very quickly to conclude um the presentation so what we find was that the time to net zero carbon positive can be significantly shortened um with with biochar application on these low disturbance low yield sites also the biochar carbon can help offset some co2 release from cultivation. The key thing here though is that actually blanket application which would be enough to offset entirely um, to offset entirely woodland carbon losses from the soil isn't practical because that would only, that would require blanket application which isn't really possible. Also biochar the, the, the potential biochar is very much dependent on its properties so specified biochar is really key to actually improving growth and it and there is trade-offs and um, particularly around the the potential for biochar in terms of carbon storage within biochar and biochar as a as a fertilizer of biochar to improve tree growth um we've also looked at briefly resilience um with, with climate change, and that's really around water holding capacity, but I've not really talked about that today. Um, and then further research is needed. So I've focused on, on conifer 
um, productive conifer systems particularly, but there's obviously a role for biochar and broadleaf um, forestry and low impact silviculture where it's not done in the clear fell cycle. And also there's further research um, needed on, on the role of, of mesofauna and microfauna on biochar nutrient release within biochar particles. Um, and then also that we found that mycorrhizae fungi have a, a key really for the um, interaction between the rhizosphere and charosphere and, and nutrient transfer. And our big conclusion really is the biochar can improve seedling establishment on nutrient limited soils and enhance carbon storage and GGR contribution. So thank you for listening and you're happy for any questions. Thank you, Hamish, for your presentation. Um, really interesting topic. I especially like the picture of the mite. Um, that looks like a horror movie. Um, if anyone has any questions, please uh, just unmute yourself or write into the chat. Um, so I, I have maybe a starting question. Um, so how did you apply or what is the targeted application method you use? Do you just put the biochar into the mount when it's when the seedling is put in there or? How do you do that? Yeah, so what we did was there's, there's, there's two, we, we identified two ways to get the biochar in with the tree in a targeted way. So we looked at bare root trees, so they're, they're trees which don't have any soil in the roots when they're planted from the nursery into the, into the forest. And what we looked at is, is when they create a plant hole, the tree goes in and then the biochar is, is, um, applied around the roots of the tree and they're, they're fairly we're, we're still looking at fairly low dosages obviously biochar has great potential in containerized trees where actually the biochar could be part of the growing media we didn't look at this we're looking at bare root trees because but that's that's potentially an easier way of getting it into the soil because that can be done in a single application so biochar within the growing media of containerized trees um you got a question from Thomas. Uh, would you expect similar results in hardwood forests? For low ye for low yield, it depends on it depends on the species, um, particularly with with um, with broad leaves. So fairly fast growing broad leaves on low nutrient soils then yes things like birch on poor pt polyzols for instance then yes less so if it's a if it's a good quality say agricultural soil which is being forested with say oak and there's potentially less benefit for biochar in the systems that we looked at but obviously there is other other benefits so it's having the right biochar for the right um for the right the right system really the other thing that's worth noting as well is that actually modern planting now is is really moving towards favoring better quality soils but the existing woodlands which are on very poor soils they have to be restocked so that's why we're really looking at that but ideally the soil is going to be good enough to actually be able to support trees particularly in planting and because broad leaves particularly in the UK aren't managed on, in using clear fell systems the the application during planting is potentially less less relevant there okay um, so um, Michael was uh, asking in regards to the lack of uh, phosphorus uptake was the phosphorus added to the biochar at time of application or was it allowed to marry with the biochar for some time before the application so did you did you i think the question is did you so that'll be for the added phosphorus yes yeah, so what we did was we yeah so we had the two we had the two different we had the two biochars which had which only had native phosphorus, the phosphorus that was within the biochar, but the one that was added phosphorus, what we did was we infused the biochar with phosphorus 
um, and then it was dried, and it was it was fully dried. So we had um, phosphorus in solution that was fully yeah fully dried, and then it was added to the to the um, to the tree. So it wasn't it wasn't a mixture between with a biochar and TSP fertilizer. What it was 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 biochar that had been infused with phosphorus, and then fully dried before being added. Um, and and we, we also looked at the um, internal, we, we, we also um, made sure that the, bio, the, the phosphorus was, was through the internal structure of the biochar, it wasn't just on the surface as well. Um, so, Dr. Mega, um, I can't read the full name, is, uh, was asking, how do you determine how much biochar is sufficient for soil improvement in order to improve the yield? I think you tested three different dosages, am I right? Yeah, so what we did was we we only looked at the phosphorus requirement to canopy closure. So we didn't um, we didn't look at we we because we were only interested in in the initial phase of establishment when actually biochar can be effective what we did was we looked at the phosphorus content of the of the soil and from the literature the phosphorus requirement for the the, the different species and then we added in the the um the the moderate dose that we added was the difference between the soil phosphorus and the phosphorus requirement for the seedlings, or the, the available phosphorus, I should say, not total phosphorus. Okay, um, so that's how we calculated the dosages for that, but only within the, the mound. We, we, were, we were only interested in improving the phosphorus within the planting mound, not the bulk soil, because we wouldn't be able to apply enough biochar for that. Um, and then a more general question. Um, do you know how you can activate biochar to make it more effective in alkaline soils? I'm I'm going to answer to that. No, because we didn't actually look at alkaline soils. Um, we only looked at acidic soils. Um, and then uh, what, I just saw that Paul was raising his uh, hand. So please, Paul. Yes, uh, I greatly enjoyed the presentation. I thought it, it showed a lot of merits and things. <clears throat> the It seemed that, and please you can confirm or uh, clarify things which I'm saying here. It seemed that the use of artificial or the chemical fertilizers was actually downplayed was not as good as what uh, might be told by a salesman, okay? And uh, my specific question is in the VCS, which is your sort of recommended um, type there, I'd like you to repeat or to clarify a little bit more as to how this biochar is made. Uh, you made some comment about the outer and I didn't catch it right, some centimeters of the timber, this would be the slash, not slash, the, the slabs coming off of the, of the timber at the sawmills. Was this the, the right way to get it? Give us a little bit of guidance on how to make this biochar, which you're finding to have been the sort of recommended part. Yeah, sure. So the well, the first question there really on on commercial fertilizer, the I, I would say that it it's not particularly effective in in forestry, particularly in the UK, because at the moment, really, commercial fertilization of forests really amounts to a scoop of of um, MPK fertilizer going on the planting mounds at planting, and then no further fertilization is done. And really none of that, those nutrients are actually going to be taken up by the tree. If it goes into the planting hole and it's targeted, then actually the, what we found is that the potential benefit of that fertilizer in terms of nutrient delivery is outweighed by the potential for root death and um, inhibiting mycorrhizal growth. 
um, for that. Now, in terms of actually the biochars that, that we use, so our specified biochar, which we found that that works, but obviously our study was limited to the, the three different biochars that we studied. So that doesn't mean that other biochars are going to be less effective. Um, we only tested um, these three different types. And, and the biochar that we tested, that's made, so when a, when a log goes to the sawmill, it's, the most of it is is debarked during during um, delimbing in the forest in the UK because of the way it's the way it's harvested um, when it's when it's not manually felled. So most of the bark comes off, but then it goes um, in certain sawmills through a ring debarker. So when it goes through a ring debarker, then that really unpeels the the outside of the tree. So what we get is between twenty and thirty percent bark, um, and then the rest of it is is wood but it's it that wood which also contains the vascular cambium and it's within the vascular cambium where most of the nutrients within the wood of the tree are proportionally are, are stored so using that as a feedstock particularly phosphorus then that has the highest phosphorus so what we found was actually the the phosphorus content of vcz biochar which contains the vascular cambium cambial zone um, is is be about between five and ten times higher than than wood. So th in general, um, if that if that clarifies the the question. But but it was only particular sawmills that actually produce this exact um, this exact sawmill residue. Okay, uh, how beneficial or detrimental would be the inclusion of the bark itself? In terms of structure, the the bark is 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 fairly good, but it's it's low phosphorus, so it, it's not going to do. It's not going to be detrimental, but it's not going to deliver the same nutrient potential as as the the BCZ zone. And um, so the cork the cork cambium and the bark doesn't actually have very much phosphorus in it comparatively um, to the the BCZ. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Hamish, um, for your presentation. Uh, really nice to see your results. Um, those are really nice uh, root growth uh, pictures. Um, so thanks, Carla, and thanks, uh, Hamish, for these presentations. And we have our next webinar in two weeks.